Hi everyone, we're going to get started in just a couple minutes. We're just waiting for everybody to come in. Hello everyone and welcome to this July morning meetup of the Arts and Culture Accessibility Cooperative, ADA 101 Americans with Disabilities Act Basics. My name is Megan Harms and I'm the Arts and Culture Coordinator with Mind's Eye and I will be the facilitator today. I am a white woman in my early 40s with long gray hair. This webinar is going to begin shortly. We're just going to give it maybe one more minute while um, everyone trickles in. This webinar will be recorded. The recording will be emailed to all registrants in a few days. Please give us a minute. <laughs> it usually takes um, until Friday or Saturday to get that going um, because we have to get the captions in and get everything right. Um, so let's make sure that that give us a couple days there. Along with the recording, you'll also receive a list of resources and a survey. The video will also be available on my t Mind's Eyes YouTube channel. Today we're going to be using the Q&A box as well as the raise your hand function. Feel, please feel free to go ahead and drop any questions in the Q&A box throughout the presentation and we'll try to get through as many as we can. During the Q&A time you may also raise your hand if you would like to speak and we'll give you permission. Uh, on a Windows device that is Alt Y and on a Mac that is Option Y. So you have a choice, Q&A box or raise your hand. Um, we won't get to raise your hand till the, the end during the Q&A time, but you can put your questions in the Q&A box anytime you want to. Closed captions are available via communication access real-time translation. Just select the CC button on the bottom of your toolbar. We also have an American Sign Language interpreter with us. He is pinned at the moment to ensure that he remains on screen throughout the webinar for the recording. For best viewing, we recommend hiding non-video participants by clicking the three dots at the top right corner of any participant box. If you would like the ASL interpreter's box to be larger, remain in speaker view. You may also want to pin the interpreter to make sure he stays on your screen. His name is David. If you want to see the speaker as well as the interpreter, please switch to gallery view. And actually, I'm going to pin um, Beth when she comes on, so you shouldn't have that problem. Live audio description is also available. Although we will be doing a lot of open description today, there will be a little video in the middle that will be uh, audio described. You need to click the interpretation button that's near the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. It's a little globe. Then you're going to choose audio description from the list of languages. If you're on a phone or a device with a small screen, you may need to hit the more button to find those. Um, you, there, there is a catch with audio description. You have to join the meeting, um, the meeting audio through your audio, from through your computer audio. You can't listen to interpretation if you use dial-in or call me phone features. Also, chat to everyone has been disabled due to its interference with screen readers. You can still chat to me. Um, just you can chat directly to the panelists. And I mentioned earlier, you're going to receive a survey about this webinar, both through Zoom at the end of this and also in the email that I send back. Your, fee your feedback is really helpful to us and our funders, uh, importantly. So take a few minutes to do that. And if you aren't already a member of our Facebook group, you can find us at facebook.com slash groups slash ACACSTL. We would like to acknowledge that Mind's Eye is located in Belleville, Illinois, the ancestral lands of many people, including the tribes commonly known as the Sioux, Quapaw, Miami, Osage, Kaskaskia, and Kickapoo. We also acknowledge those tribes who passed near our area during their forced removal, 
including the Cherokee, Delaware, Sac and Fox, and Shawnee. The process of knowing and acknowledging the ground beneath our feet is a way of honoring and expressing gratitude for the people on this land before us. And this is a map of St. Louis, the St. Louis area with several overlapping colors, each representing a different tribe that lived in this land before us. And you can find this interactive map at native-land.ca. Uh, native also, July is Disability Pride Month. So this is uh, something, a, a new slide for us. This is Disability Pride Month. This is the flag and the symbolism comes from the creator Anne McGill. Um, the, the black field symbolizes the mourning for those who've suffered and died from ableist violence and also rebellion. The zigzag band, how disabled people must move around and past barriers and our creative, creativity in doing so. The five colors, the variety of disability, our needs and experiences, mental illness, neurodiversity, invisible and undiagnosed disabilities, physical disability and sensory disabilities, and the parallel black stripes, solidarity within the disability community despite our differences. And now I would like to introduce our moderator for today. Um, Virginia Sanders. Jenny Sanders is the Special Initiatives Coordinator for the Missouri Arts Council. The duties include Missouri Arts Awards, Poetry Out Loud, Arts and Aging, Missouri Poet Laureate, and the 504 ADA Coordinator. Virginia has been with the Missouri Arts Council since 2003. Prior to coming to the Missouri Arts Council, she was in the apparel industry as a market and product manager for over 30 years. In 2009, she was presented the Award of Excellence from VSA National for her work with VSA Missouri. Also in 2009, Virginia was selected to represent Missouri at the National Summit on Careers in the Arts for People with Disabilities at the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts in Washington, D.C. Participation was by invitation only. In 2013, she was chosen to, to take part in a nationwide initiative founded by the National Endowment for the Arts and administered by the National Center for Creative Aging. Virginia was appointed to lead the initiative for Missouri to develop a plan for the statewide communities of practice in arts, health, and aging initiative. In 2015, Virginia presented the intergenerational program. Um, she presented the intergenerational program of Poetry Out Loud, Poetry for Life with Gary Glasner, noted expert on Alzheimer's and memory loss at a congressional briefing in Washington, DC, hosted by Senator Claire McCaskill. Jenny, I'm so glad that you are with us today. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you if you are there. And you can introduce Beth. Can you hear me? Yes, now I got gotcha. you. Okay. Uh, I'm Jenny Sanders. I am a white female with red hair, wearing Harman glasses and a white top with flowers sitting in front of a brick wall with bookcases. Thank you for joining the ACA morning meetup this morning uh, with uh, Beth Bedvenu uh, presenting Amer ADA 101 Americans with Disability. Uh, Beth is the director of the Office of Accessibility for the National Endowment for the Arts. I first met Beth in 2009 at the National Summit of Careers in the Arts for the People with Disabilities at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. At that time, she was working for the U.S. Department of Labor. Since then, Beth has been a mentor and a friend. She now manages the NEA Technical Assistance and Advocacy to work with the artists with disabilities, older adults, veterans, and people with institutional settings. She provides guidance and support to the state arts agency staff and professional working field of the arts access, creating aging and arts and health, universal design and arts and corrections. Prior to her work at the NEA, she worked as a policy advisor for the U.S. Department of Labor and Disabilities, where she analyzed public and private sector policies, practices, <clears throat> related to employment with artists and others with disability. She has served as an adjunct professor for George Mason University, Master of Arts and Arts Management Program. She has taught courses in art policy and 
and excuse me and comparative international arts policy and she has a background in performing arts manager dr bavenu has a master's in sociology and arts administration from indiana university and a doctorate of organizational leadership from the university of art Oklahoma. In addition, Beth is a talented vocalist and musician. She is part of the Eastern European Women's Folk Ensemble and plays percussion in the Maryland Community Band. Now I give you Beth Benvenu. Thank you so much, Jenny. I am so happy to be here and thank you for the warm welcome. It's been wonderful working with you in my almost 11 years at the NEA. Oh, and, and there you are, Ginny, <laughs> your, 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 your camera was off, but it's great to see you. Um, Ginny was one of the first people that I started working with at the NEA, because um, we work with state arts agencies across the country, and Ginny's been a great advocate and ally in this work to make the arts accessible. Um, so, and I'd also like to thank Megan and Mind's Eye and everyone with ACAC for this invitation. I'm happy to talk with you today about cultural accessibility. I am a white woman with shoulder length brown hair and I'm wearing a black and white print top. I'm sitting in my home office outside Washington DC because we're all still teleworking. Um, and I, um, I have it behind me a, a, a window, uh, a purple wall, a colorful painting by a local artist I always like to credit. His name is Joel Trailer, um, and some little plants in the background. So tried to make it a, 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 a hopefully the rate your 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 background is is a little um, is okay uh, for, for my background here today. Um, and uh, so I just I I, I want to give greetings from the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, and I will give a little background on who we are and what my office does and launch into our presentation. So I'm going to share my screen. And when I sh sh share the screen um, I, for the video, I'm going to have to drop out and pull up the video. But um, oh, I also want to give just a little bit of a disability check in. Sometimes uh, people like to share what their disability is. Uh, especially if it helps, um, you know, explain anything in the in, in your presentation. I am a person who stutters, and you may hear it, you may not. If you're lucky, you might get to hear it today. Um, I'm uh, feeling a little less stuttery today, so but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, but um, I am a proud stutterer and happy to talk about it at any time. So I'm going to pull up my slides and. This is always a fun technical thing that we do here, but I really do like presenting in Zoom because I can control everything. And so um, I start off with a, a photo that many of you may be familiar with. It's from the disability rights movement taken by Tom Olin in 1990. Uh, it is a, a, a photo, a black and white photo of a number of people who, look, who are at, at a march in New York City. Uh, there is a banner that says injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere by Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and in the photo are, as I said, uh, many people, it, people in wheelchairs, um, uh, holding the banner, uh, you know, uh, people who are, are, are standing. Um, and I, I just want to point out a few prominent uh, people over on the left. Uh, we have Marco Bristow, uh, a strong disability advocate uh, uh, using a, a manual wheelchair. Uh, there's also Judy Human, uh, who's in a white shirt. She's in a power chair. She's wearing a hat um, and wearing a white shirt. She um, is an, another key figure in the disability rights movement who you may have uh, heard of through the the film, uh, the documentary film Crip Camp, uh, as the, talking about the, early, the 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 504 protests in uh, San Francisco and the 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 origins of that, uh, starting with a group of teenagers at a summer camp. I think it was upstate New York. Um, and then over to the right is Justin Dart, who you may be familiar with, who people call the father of the Americans with Disabilities Act. He's wearing his uh, trademark hat, um, a suit, and he's, he has, uh, he's in a wheelchair. Um, and so this is, uh, this is very timely because yesterday was the 31st anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it's an important landmark um, uh, piece of legislation and we'll be talking about it today. I also wanna recognize that I know that there are many experts here in the room on accessibility. I know it's a mixed group. So um, I, I, I know that many of you are very aware of all of this, but I'm going to make sure that I point out key moments in history throughout. Um, so, 
To the National Endowment for the Arts, we are a public agency, a federal agency, dedicated to advancing artistic excellence, creativity, and innovation for the benefit of individuals and communities. We award more than $115 million each year to arts organizations of all sizes in all 50 states and US territories. Um, I also wanna note real quick that I, uh, with the screen share, I'm not able to see the interpreters or anyone else. So if, if there's any problems, please speak up and let me know. I did pull up the chat so I can see that. Um, I'll also pull up the Q&A. Um, I believe we have the Q&A activated so I can answer questions either throughout or at the end. So please enter those. Um, and uh, 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 Megan, if you need to, communicate with me, you can either unmute or um, type your, your message in. Um, and also wanna remind folks that there is audio description available using the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen, but I'm going to describe the images to take the load off of the audio describer, but I'm not a professional audio describer. I, but um, So at the bottom of the page to illustrate some of the work of the National Endowment for the Arts, there's a photo of um, a, a, an African-American gentleman playing, uh, it's either a trumpet or a flugelhorn, um, it's, it's brass instrument. And then uh, on the right is, uh, women and girls uh, with colorful traditional costumes from the Pacific Islands. And um, so I wanted to say a word about our funding. Um, we have normal, our normal granting cycle. We have a number of grant opportunities throughout the year. Um, and that's where the $115 million comes from or goes. Um, but this year we have um, funding through the American Rescue Plan. Uh, and this is to support the arts sector as it recovers from the devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, because we recognize how hard it's been on arts, arts organizations. And so Congress allocated $135 million for, um, to help, um, to help our, the arts sector recover. 40% um, uh, of the, of those funds went directly to the state arts agencies. So uh, people like uh, uh, Jenny uh, get to use that to help organizations in their state. And then the rest we will we are administering through our ARP grants. The part one deadline for arts organizations is August 12th. So I encourage you to go to arts.gov for more information. There's all sorts of information plus technical assistance. And um, today at 11 a.m. Eastern, we have an information session, a, a Q&A um, for, uh, for anyone with questions. And we're, we're providing sign language interpretation for that session, as well as captions. So um, you can sign up. Uh, you need to register in advance to attend that to get the Zoom link. So you can do that while you watch this. Or, um, and then there's also an image on our screen. Uh, it's a logo that we've, we're using for, to promote the rest of the ARP funds. Um, it says apply uh, for American Rescue Plan grants, rebuilding the creative community, um, arts.gov forward slash ARP hyphen grants. And that's where you can go to find information on the uh, Q&A sessions. Um, and uh, there, there are images repeated throughout this, this logo. And um, at the top are our images it's re repeated images of the same one, and it's from Family Theater Company, which is a theater company in Denver that um, uh, is for uh, is, is for and by people with disabilities. And at the bottom are also images of people lounging um, uh, uh, in posed for the picture, and that is the Asian American Writers Workshop. The image from Family Theater. I want to say it's it's the production of it looks like a production of Annie. It's a bunch of young people on a stage. Uh, uh, posed uh, looking out at the, at the audience. Okay, so, um, so my office, the Office of Accessibility, we provide resources to help make the arts accessible for people with disabilities, veterans, older adults, and those in institutional settings. We provide technical assistance to applicants, grants, grantees, and constituents. And we also, I wanted to note that we work with the um, 50 state arts agencies plus six territorial um, uh, agency, arts agencies and six regional arts organizations 
each one has an accessibility coordinator, and that's what uh, uh, Jenny Sanders is for um, the state of Missouri. And uh, we work closely with them to provide technical and assistance and training so that they can then assist uh, organizations and individuals throughout their states. Um, okay, I also have a problem with um, dry throat. So I'm gonna be, you'll see me drinking different beverages throughout um, so that I don't start coughing. Um, okay, so the goals for today, uh, we're going to cover a bit about disability etiquette and language, we're going to provide an, uh, an overview of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act, um, some basics about physical and program access, including a bit about virtual access, since that is so present today and over the past year, um, a bit about budgeting for accessibility, communication, partnerships, and resources. So some of the common themes that we see throughout this presentation, but throughout this work and the things that we need to keep in mind. Um, and, and these are that we need to build in accessibility from the start, um, you know, rather than having it be an afterthought or something to add later. Um, include people with disabilities on your staff and board and work with artists with disabilities um, to make sure that, that, that there's representation and voices are heard. <clears throat> Assess the access needs of your community and be responsive. Partner with organizations serving people with disabilities. Train all staff and volunteers um, and, and use uh, effect, uh, uh, you, especially those that are involved with communications with your, with, with your public. And then start small and take the first step. Don't be too overwhelmed. Just start and then take the first step. So just a bit of background about disability in the United States. Um, there are 61 million Americans living with disabilities. This is according to the CDC and the American Community Survey. They, they comprise 26% of the US population. It's the largest minority group in the United States and the only one that any of us can join at any time. Nearly 30% of families have a person with a disability and we have a growing American, uh, a growing older population. I wanna note that there are different measures of disability in the population that you might hear uh, data like 12.9% or 19%. That's because there's different ways of measuring based on age um, and, you know, uh, so, and, and, and whether they're working age or, you know, some, some of them leave out children or older adults, but this is a number that, that we've been using lately. Um, so we, we talk about how our, our population is aging. You know, we're, we're very aware of the, the, the baby boomer population uh, uh, being a large, you know, uh, much larger than the other generations before. Um, and there are 77.3 million uh, baby boomers according to the US census. Um, and that's a people born, uh, born between 1946 and 1964. 10,000 of them are turning 65 every day. By 2030, we will have more people over age 60 than under age 30. The 55 plus age group controls more than three quarters of America's wealth. And the reason I bring all of this up, as you can imagine, is number one, this is an, a huge part of your audience, um, whether you're a museum or performing arts, um, you probably are aware that you know that that you know older adults have more more time. If they're retired, um, they have more wealth. So they're a huge audience. And as we know, we all acquire disabilities as we age. So we need to be open, welcoming, and accessible. Um, and I always point. Um, I don't know if you can see. It's I can't see myself. Um, I I have a, a thumb brace because I have arthritis in my thumbs. But um, I also have it in my knees. And you know, at some, at some point, it's going to be really hard for me to to get out and um, and go to events. Um, so um, accessibility is important for retaining this important audience. And this image um, is of several women. There are three in the foreground who are in an art class. They all, they all appear to be older adults um, and they are, are painting one with the sponge brush. And um, when I was looking at this photo, I was noticing how nicely dressed up she is. And she has an apron on, and, but hopefully doesn't get any paint on her lovely jacket. But um, so this is uh, an image from Arts for the Aging in Rockville, Maryland. Um, and it was a presenting and multidisciplinary grantee for the National Endowment for the Arts. So the other, the other side of this, um, it, we, we, we're going to talk about the laws, and that's where where people need to be sure that they're in compliance with the laws. But we also 
want to to present the positive side of this that um, equity um, it, it's a it, disability is an important part of the equity conversation that we've been engaged in um, for years but a lot in the last year um, and uh, so it, it's it's good for the organization to be as as accessible as possible um, so accessibility is an organizational asset if you make your programs or facilities accessible to people with disabilities, it opens it up to everyone. Um, so it's it, when you're making the case to your board, to your, your funders, that um, it's good to know that it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an asset that can help you um, uh, with, with your organizational goals. It's a vital and often overlooked part of diversity and equity work. And I think I'm seeing a bit more of it included lately, and hopefully that's a pot, it's an ongoing trend. Disability provides a unique perspective in artistic creation, and it allows for a wider reach and opens up to new audiences. And as I said, also to retain aging audiences. So um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, language and disability etiquette to help you in welcoming people with disabilities to your arts organization. We talk a lot about person first language, which I'll, I'll discuss here, but first, I want to uh, just give a little uh, uh, overview of two different ways of looking at disability that we've seen uh, um, historically and currently. We, we primarily, uh, what we see in the media, what we see in science and medicine is the medical model, is the idea that people, uh, the individuals must be fixed. If you have a disability, there's something wrong that needs to be fixed. And this idea um, is the, it's that the problem it, the problems that people encounter is rooted in the disability and the individual with the disability must adapt. Um, so it's, it's very much focused on fixing things, cures, and it doesn't necessarily help people with disabilities navigate the world and, 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 and be independent. So um, I think this has been around for many years is the social model is that in an accessible world, people can thrive. Um, so that the problem is rooted in the inaccessible world, that, that the problem is not in the person in the wheelchair, it's in the, in the stairs, that the, the, the lack of a ramp or the lack of a no step entry into a building. And once these barriers are addressed, disability is no longer the problem. So if you have the sign language interpreters and the captioning and the audio description in your, um, in, in, in your webinar, in your video, or in your program, in, in your performance, then the disability is not a problem. It's, it's that the, 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 uh, the environment is the problem if it's not accessible. So we try to use this in our thinking and it's a great way of approaching things um, in your organization. So when people are concerned about language, you know, what, um, what do I say? Am I gonna say the wrong thing? Um, decades ago, uh, people started using the term, the, the, the concept of person first language, that you're a person with a disability, your disability does not define you. Um, and so rather than um, saying that, you know, that, that we have the, the disability first, it's your person first. Um, and so, uh, and, and so in the left hand column, we have the more affirmative statements. And in the right hand column, we have the, the terms that we're trying to, to stay away from. So instead of, instead of saying, oh, and, and the term, quote, handicapped is a word that is, um, is very old, it's outdated. It refers to the time when people would beg on the corner with their cap in hand. So that's where handicap comes from. Um, and you may still see it um, used for like parking or, or other things. And I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, uh, so rather than using terms like normal, that, that implies that people are not are either normal or they're not. That's very stigmatizing. So just say a person without a disability. Um, and then the term able-bodied, it's better just to say a person without a disability. Um, the terms crippled and lame are very outdated. And we use lame a lot in non disability related conversation like, oh, this party is lame. So just try to avoid that because it's stigmatizing uh, uh, for people with disabilities. So just say a person with a physical disability. Um, and uh, the terms wheelchair bound or confined to a wheelchair are also very problematic because people are not bound to their wheelchairs. They, they may be strapped in with a, a seat belt. Um, and when we're in the field of physically integrated dance, you can see some amazing work that they do when they are strapped into their chairs, but they're not bound to their chairs. Um, the, a wheelchair is a, uh, provides independence um, and it's, it's, it's their freedom. 
So um, th it's really important not to use those terms. Just say a person who uses a wheelchair or a wheelchair user. And then um, avoid terms like suffers from or is a victim of because that's also stigmatizing and, and you don't know if they're suffering. Um, many people are, are, are perfectly fine. So um, just say a person has this disability or a person with. And I wanna give one caveat. Um, at the top, we, you know, we says do not use the disabled. The term, using the term disabled, um, it's a choice. Many people with disabilities prefer to use that. Say, I am a disabled dancer, I am a disabled woman, because it is their identity and it's an important part of them. So you'll hear a lot of people use that language. Um, I think those of us in government tend, and, and other institutions tend to still use person first because it appears to be the most uh, respectful, um, but some of us are kind of mixing it up a little bit. So I might say disabled dance or disabled dancers or disabled artists. Um, and, but when you're working with individuals, it's best to go with what they prefer and the term that they use. Um, and so the uh, one theme through here is adding the word the in front of something, the blind, the deaf, the, the sightless. It's better to just say a person who is blind or has low vision. Um, and then uh, in the deaf community, um, you can say a deaf person or the deaf community, person who is hard of hearing. Um, but uh, uh, we want to note, there's an asterisk that says the deaf community has a strong sense of identity and uses uh, the capital D for recognizing that they're culturally deaf. And the lowercase d is used for the audiological ability or inability to hear. So you might see uh, it capitalized and it's a, it's, it's a form of pride and um, often you will, you will not see as much person first language. Um, so then uh, for people with psychiatric disabilities or mentally Ill, uh, mental illness, please avoid the terms crazy, emotionally disturbed, it's very stigmatizing. Um, you know, there, there's many different ways to refer to mental health issues. Um, and then for people with cognitive or intellectual disabilities, avoid the terms slow, retarded. We talk about the R word, of, please avoid the R word. It's still in some, some government language, you know, going back to, you know, the, an agency for, you know, they, they use the term mental retardation. Government agencies, state and, and, and federal are, are changing the language to take that out. Um, and, and don't use the term Downs, you know, Down syndrome is a, dis it is a condition, but it's, don't refer to someone as Downs. And then the term special needs is a, um, it's kind of controversial. I don't want to say controversial. It's a point of contention because um, many people with disabilities don't like it because um, your needs aren't necessarily special. Uh, they're, they're just what you need to, to um, be independent and, and receive your education or other things. But a lot of people in the schools and uh, a lot of parents still use it. So um, I, I can't tell you one way or the other, but I know that uh, a lot of people prefer that we try to move away from that language. And there's a great um, f uh, video that I'm not gonna show today, but it, it's from World Down Syndrome Day, where a group of um, actors and others with Down Syndrome, including uh, Lauren Potter from the show Glee, talk about you know what are special, what, what are these needs really special? It might be special if you, um, want to wear a suit of armor, that's a special need. If, if, if you need to be woken up in the morning by a celebrity and they show these things throughout the video and it's very cute. Um, and I can, I can look for the, um, I can, I can, we can include the link in the follow-up. So just basics also avoid the word, you know, like I said, handicap, like people still use it for parking spaces, restrooms, say accessible restroom or, or disability, um, accessible parking, accessible restroom. And then again, special implies that something is different. It doesn't promote inclusivity. So if you have a separate, not a separate, but if you have an additional program like um, extra hours for quiet, you know, um, sensory friendly or quiet time, things like that, don't call it special, just, you know, give it the name that it has. Um, and then the terms challenge and impaired, you know, we still use vision impaired or hearing impaired and, um, but, but don't you tr try to avoid using it in other contexts because it implies something is broken or not working. Pause just for a second. Um, so, to be welcoming for people with to people with disabilities, um, make sure that your website and um, is at, number one that it's accessible. We'll talk about that in a moment. But to have an accessibility statement and web page. 
a, a page with contact information and resources and how to access your programs will be really helpful and make sure that you know how to navigate to that. Um, it can be in your about or how to visit sections of your website. Um, when, you pro when you promote your events, promote the accessibility. Um, the accessibility features that you're going to have and include contact information. Phone and email are both important for so people have different ways of reaching you. Um, make sure there's disability representation, like, like if you have photos in your brochure, make sure you're including um, people with disabilities, if you have photos on your website, but also any of your other, um, you know, any, or anything else that you do, we'll be talking about that. Um, and your social media, make sure that you caption your videos, pr provide alt text for your images, things like that. Um, uh, train your staff. There are a lot, pro you probably have a lot of local uh, people who can do staff training for you. And then um, I mentioned these, I'm about to show one from the Washington DC government. Um, and then the, not, the, the, down, the World Down Syndrome Day video is called Not Special Needs. So, um, and just an example of an accessibility statement, the Alabama Shakespeare Festival, this is a, a quote from, from their website. The Alabama Shakespeare Festival values inclusiveness and diversity in its many forms. We are committed to recognizing the accessibility needs of our patrons and strive to make our productions and facilities accessible to any patron who wishes to enjoy the magic of live theater. So, you know, that's the type of thing you can think about when you are um, uh, including an accessibility statement on your website. And now I'm going to show a video. Um, uh, this is, uh, so actually I wanna make sure that this is, uh, I, think we're, I think we're providing a bit of audio description about this. It's a, um, a, a video pr produced, it's about seven years old that it's called, uh, You Don't Need to Be Awkward. And uh, it sh shows a series of awkward interactions as well as um, the better way to engage in these interactions. And I'm going to stop my screen share. And um, yeah, I, I, I see the chat now. Someone said they love this video. It's cute. I, you've probably seen it if you've been in the field for a while, but I wanna make sure that you, people get a chance to see it. Um, okay, so that, speaking of awkward, it's that time when you have to switch over to your video because if I were to click on it, you would have to sit through an ad. But I, I, um, I have got already skipped through the ad. So if anyone can't hear the um, hear the audio, please let me know. But I think I activated it. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, there, big man. Morning, Alice! There's no need to be awkward. Poor Bob. Like so many of us, he just doesn't know how to interact with people with disabilities. It's pretty easy, really. People with disabilities are people first. We need the same things that every person needs, like respect. Good morning, everyone. Attention! Uh, okay. Maybe we need to be more specific. The easiest way to show respect is to focus on the person, not the disability. It's okay, you'll get the hang of it. One easy way to focus on the person is to watch the person signing and not their interpreter. Or their companion. It's really cool that you'd like to help but do us both a favor and please ask me first. What you think might be helping? I got you. Wait, wait, ah! Oh no, might actually not. If you'd like to offer me help, let me hold on to your elbow. Don't take mine. Hey, would you like to take mine? Sure. <laughs> Assistive devices help us to live our lives. They're really important and really personal. Grabbing them only makes it weird for everyone. What? Please only touch our devices and service animals if we've given you permission. And don't take it personally if I ask you not to. Remember that my service animal helps me all the time. 
Neither of us would like it if we were separated. Remember, we make our own decisions. We sign documents, vote, volunteer, work, and pay taxes. We get married. So don't address me just because I have a great smile. Just because I'm blind. May I help you? Does not mean I'm deaf. Just because I'm deaf doesn't mean I'm blind. And just because I use a wheelchair doesn't mean that I can't sweep you off your feet. So take a deep breath, relax. We don't fight. Unless we're really hungry. Hello, dear lady. How are you? Hello. And if you're not sure what to do, just ask. Hi, would you still like to see a menu? Uh, no thanks, but can you please read it to me? Sure, definitely. Just treat us the way you would want to be treated, and we'll all be okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Alice. Good morning. Awkward no more. Nice job, Bob. Go forth and be human. There's no need to be awkward. Captain Myers Carter, Liberty Mutual. Sorry, I just jumped right into the um, right into the ad. So, okay. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, like I said, it's it's been around for a while. Um, and if you if you deliver training uh, for your staff, I think that's a good one to show. Um, Let's see, I will pull the slides back up and go back into that show. Okay. All right, so just to continue, um, I keep having to pull my chat back up. Okay, so you may have heard the phrase, nothing about us without us. Um, this is a phrase that's been used for a long time and it's um, making sure that people with disabilities are included in all organizational aspects. It can be the board, staff, volunteers, panels, committees, etc. cetera. Um, it, doing a community needs assessment will help, um, you know, bringing in people with disabilities to help you do that, to see what, you know, who's in the community and what you might need to provide to ensure access and engagement for your, your whole community. Um, develop partnerships with organizations like Minds Eye uh, that serve people with disabilities, and make sure that you employ artists uh, with disabilities. And you know, it, in your um, wh whether you're curating, casting, um, you know, uh, uh, showing the work, and em employ people with disabilities throughout your organization. Um, oh, and I also want to note that the phrase "nothing about us without us." Uh, lately has kind of shifted into nothing nothing without us. Make sure that people with disabilities are included in, in anything that you do. Um, so it, I just wanna make a note about customer service and communications. Um, if you don't know how to accommodate a request that you might get, just ask, listen, and respond and be available to receive. Um, just to make sure that you're responsive, to, um, to have an ongoing dialogue and all of that can be can, can be just conducive to having open communication. And I wanna note that there's an image here from the Vermont Studio Center in Johnson, Ver Vermont. Um, hold on a second, okay. And uh, it's, it's an image of uh, a man seated at a, a table in an art studio and he is painting with a, a paintbrush using his mouth and um, his hands are at his side. And there's some paintings on the wall and uh, some paintings in front of him on the table. And the Johnson Studio Center is one of our grantees and it has an artist, artist residencies for disabled artists. So um, we're going to shift now uh, to talk a bit about the laws um, and, the, and the regulations from the National Endowment for the Arts um, under, under these laws. And um, uh, I wanna note that we have a, a series of, um, of, of graphic images on the screen. And these are downloadable disability access symbols from the Graphic Artists Guild. 
And you've probably seen a lot of these images, encountered them, um, and there are six of them on the screen in black and white. They represent closed captioning, large print, sign language, assisted li listening, uh, the universal symbol for wheelchair access, and a, a symbol for um, act that with a, a, a person with a, a white cane, with a symbol for um, uh, uh, access for people with vision disabilities. And we'll, we're sending out the links afterward, and uh, we'll have the link to the Graphics Artist Guild's downloadable disability access symbols, which are very useful. You can put them in your programs. You can put them, um, you know, in signage to indicate where to, you know, what table to go to to get your assisted listening devices, various things like that. So the two laws that uh, that you, you're probably aware of that govern um, accessibility for arts organizations are the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, namely Section 504, and the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. And just an overview about both of them. Um, the, 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 the general requirements are non-discrimination, equal opportunity, and the provision of any reasonable modifications, auxiliary aids or services necessary to achieve it, such as sign language interpretation, audio description, et cetera. It also includes basic standards of architectural access, such as entrances, rooms, et cetera, and equal access to employment, programs, activities, goods, and services. So to get more specific about the two laws, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. You might have, you might be, those who are new to this might be familiar with the term 504 from um, ed, uh, uh, education. Uh, students will often have a 504 plan uh, if, if, they, if they don't call it IEP. Um, this is because uh, 504 covers any um, entity that receives federal funds. So it prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in programs conducted by federal agencies, such as any events that the NEA conducts, and also those receiving federal financial assistance, such as NEA grantees, state arts agencies, et cetera. So all, all of these entities must um, prevent and pre ensure that they are not discriminating on the basis of disability. The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, otherwise known as the ADA. Um, I just wanna make a note that when the Re Rehabilitation Act was passed in 1973, it took many years for the agencies to um, uh, uh, implement the regulations that govern it. So that's why there were the 504 protests that, that as, they, as they've been called, um, that was depicted in the, in the film Crip Camp. And once those were implemented in um, later in the 1970s, I forget exact, the exact year, uh, 76 or 77, um, the agencies worked to put their regulations out and the National Endowment for the Arts was the third agency of all government agencies to implement their regulations. And we were the first small agency to implement ours. So I like to brag on that just a little bit. It wasn't me, it was my predecessors. But so that wasn't enough because it didn't cover state and local government or places of public accommodation. So uh, the ADA, after many other years of activism from, from the people that I showed in the first screen, um, uh, worked uh, and helped to, uh, to get to work with Congress to pass Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990 which prohibits discrimination and ensures equal opportunity for people with disabilities. And it was amended in 2008. So Title II of the ADA covers state and local governments, um, which includes our state arts agencies. Um, and Title III covers public accommodations and services, private organizations, commercial facilities, and transportation. So this includes uh, for this audience, you know, museums, historic sites, universities, performing arts, centers, et cetera. So the types of, of accessibility, we're going to get into that briefly. Um, and we have the same uh, on the screen are the same uh, uh, accessibility symbols that we had on a previous slide. So for physical access accessibility, we also have the little wheelchair symbol in the corner. Um, make it, um, I, 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 um, I need to update this slide because I, for physical access, I mentioned wheelchair and scoot, make, making sure that it's wheelchair and scooter accessible, but this applies to all mobility disabilities, not just those who use wheelchairs and scooters. So this includes um, entrances and routes throughout your building uh, or your grounds, display cases, exhibit areas, ticket counters, um, 
classrooms, studios, and workspaces, restrooms and water fountains. And then something that's often overlooked is your, your, if, you're, if you have a stage, your, uh, your stage and your backstage. Can you access um, the stage? Uh, can you access the backstage areas, the dressing rooms, the restrooms? And then also one thing people don't think about is whether you can get from the audience onto the stage. Like when you look at a, a big event like the Oscars or the Tony Awards, there's no often no way to get from the audience to the stage. And that's why when Ali Stroker was the first Tony winner with who was a wheelchair user, she had to wait backstage at the Tonys before she could come out to accept the award. So um, when the Oscars happened this year and there were wheelchair users who were nominated, uh, Jim Lebrecht for the film Crip Camp and his partner, Judy, Judy Human, who is featured in it, they, um, uh, they built a ramp onto the stage and it was lovely. It's just, they didn't get to go up on the ramp, which was because they did not win the Oscar, but they were nominated and they were in the audience and they were accommodated. Um, another thing to uh, th think, of my, think about is making sure that you have directional signage for accessible entrances, restrooms, et cetera. Um, if your accessible entrance is around the side or the back of the building, these signs can be incredibly important for people who have um, mobility issues because it might take a lot of extra energy and time and sometimes pain to get to those spaces and having to walk around and try to find the accessible entrance can be difficult. So to be the most welcoming, make sure that you have plenty of signage. Um, also consider your outdoor spaces, your communal areas, paths, parking, and the access, US Access Board has information on outdoor recreation access routes and we can send that link. Um, and there's an, Im an image of cabins in an outdoor setting. Um, and this is from Playa uh, in Summer Lake, Oregon, which is also an artist community um, that has provided for, that uh, has a lot of uh, residencies for people with disabilities and they received an artist communities grant from the NEA. So just a bit about program accessibility um, and effective communication. Um, this uh, applies to people with vision, vision disabilities hearing disabilities. And then the third category, I try to include, you know, uh, cognitive sensory processing brain injury, which often can have similar accommodations. Um, and then I want to focus on, on electronic accessibility, which includes websites, videos, documents, podcasts, virtual platforms, etc. cetera. Um, so I'll go through these relatively briefly. So for people with vision disabilities, uh, we focus on alternate formats for print materials, which can include large print and braille and audio, as well as tactile opportunities, sighted guides, and audio description. And um, there is a clip from uh, the, it, it was like an extra from the movie Frozen um, that uh, we, uh, uh, we'll have the link in, in the, the PowerPoint that we send afterward. And, um, so there's two images on the screen from the Baltimore Center Stage Theater. And uh, there's, it's from a pre-show touch tour of the, of the play Antigone. Um, and on the right is an image of 3D printed bones. Um, and these are, are white small um, bone objects. Actually on the screen, they're small, but they're probably a, a little larger. In person, they're wrapped in twine. So they're used in some way in the play. And on the left is a photo of um, two individuals who are seated touching fabric. So it's probably uh, costumes from the show and people are standing there um, holding them out for people to touch. So these are, this is an example of a pre-show touch tour. And sometimes uh, theater companies will also let people come up on stage and navigate and see what the stage um, is, what the, what the setup is like as well. But often it's, it's done outside. I've also seen examples of dance companies that will allow uh, people to touch the costumes and toe shoes and things like that. So lots of wonderful opportunities. For people with hearing disabilities, um, you can have assisted listening devices. Um, I don't mention it here, but there's hearing loop technology where you install a, a hearing loop in your auditorium. You can have it in your box office, other kiosks. Um, there's also sign language interpretation. Um, Oh, and so, I'm sorry, with assisted listening devices, um, they can tap into people's hearing aids. Um, it can use the loop technology for that, um, or it could be for people without hearing aids. And you just need to make sure you provide them 
um, for your, your events where you have amplification. Um, we also have captioning, open or closed, real-time captioning or CART, which you would have at a live event. Um, and then transcriptions, which are important for things like podcasts or radio shows. Um, they can also be helpful alongside a video so that people don't have to watch the entire video that they can just get the, the text. And this is an image from um, uh, an event. Actually, I took this, this, this photo, an event uh, that I attended in Pittsburgh. Uh, it shows uh, two women on a stage. One is in a wheelchair. Uh, she has um, a microphone and she's speaking and there's an interpreter standing behind them uh, gesturing in sign language. Um, and uh, actually it's uh, the person on the right is, Re is, is Rebecca Torres, who's a, an artist. And on the left is Anne Mulgrave, who's a consultant in um, accessibility. Um, okay, so uh, when I mentioned uh, cognitive uh, and sensory processing and brain injury um, accommodations for this, you might have um, quiet hours, like opening the museum an hour early, um, spaces people can go if they need just some quiet space, um, offering sensory friendly programming where you might have um, uh, toning down the, lar the, the louder sounds or, or, the, or the, um, the bright lights, um, giving warnings about loud noises that are going to happen, working with uh, people in the community who are experts in, in autism and other uh, sensory processing disorders to uh, provide other services at your events um, when, they're when you have sensory friendly programming. Um, I'll also like in an auditorium, like let's say an, a, a play or a concert, maybe raising the, the lights just a little bit so it's not completely dark in the audience, that can also be helpful. Um, offering noise canceling headphones, providing warning for strobes, which can help with people with um, seizure disorders, um, and then offering pre-visit materials or otherwise known as social stories that provides information on what to expect how to get to the venue, what they will see there. Um, it just takes them through the whole process to help ease anxiety about entering a new situation. Um, and this helps a lot of people because I know that I often need to know, okay, where am I gonna park? How am I gonna get there? That's, it's really um, important for a lot of people to, to help ease, ease anxiety. Um, and uh, in these, there's two images from the Georgia Symphony Orchestra in Marietta, Marietta Georgia. They received a Challenge America grant from the NEA. Um, on the left are two men, uh, or actually so it's like a man and a boy, each playing the trumpet. Um, uh, and then on the right is a, a man uh, playing a string bass. It looks like he's on the stage and there are people standing, looks like in the orchestra pit, reaching up to touch the, the, ba the string bass. And so this might be a pre-show or after show uh, uh, experience where people can um, have access and touch the instruments and talk with the, with the performers. So um, electronic accessibility, we, we've been hearing a lot about this lately because um, companies are being um, sued uh, for inaccessible websites. Um, so it's really important that you um, make sure that your website is accessible. And what does this mean? A lot of people don't understand exactly what that means. And I don't know, you know, the, the programming issues involved. I just know some of the basics. So it means having that your website is screen reader uh, friendly, that a, people using screen reading software uh, that can access it as the electronic screen reader reads across the page, that it um, flows logically. Um, and often uh, these, this software is tab controlled. So it, need, it needs to be designed so that you can tab from, from element to element on your screen. Um, and that there's alternative text for images. And, um, and you can, it's done easily. Um, like if I were to add alt text for the image on the screen here, it's a black uh, graphic uh, uh, disability symbol for closed captioning. You right click on it, and it's like if you're in Word or PowerPoint or, or Outlook, you right click on it and you'll see alt text and you can just um, uh, add, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting some pop-ups uh, in another uh, application. Um, and you can just add one or two sentences about what's in the image. Um, make sure that your videos are, are captioned or you provide transcripts. 
um, that they're that your your fonts are accessible. They're the not you don't use like scripty fonts or or things that are hard to read and perceive, and that you have a high color contrast. And there are tools to help you with this. Um, and that make sure that your video, film, and webcast and radio have open or closed captions, transcriptions. There's the option of creating ASL interpreted videos. You can have it side by side next to your other, your, your non-ASL interpreted video, or you can embed it in the, in the video. And that you, it's also really important to audio describe your videos. And you can have that as a, as a, a, a separate video. Um, so, because it's sometimes, it's, it's a really important way to help people with vision disabilities access your content. So some resources and tools for electronic accessibility. Um, Web AIM, um, it's W-E-B-A-I-M, is a really helpful website, and it's webaim.org. Um, there's also a the WAVE accessibility tool. Um, is uh, you, you, you plug your web address into the tool, and it will give a, a, a report on what you, need to, what you need to fix. And that's wave.webaim.org. There's the Web Accessibility Initiative, uh, w3.org um, forward slash WAI uh, that also has other resources. And just a bit about virtual accessibility. As we've seen over the last, what are we up to, 16 months, 15 months since the beginning of COVID, um, arts organizations shifted to online performances and events. And uh, it's really opened up tremendous opportunities for people to access film, uh, theater, uh, gallery visit, you know, gallery tours, museum tours, so many things have been online. And it's been incredibly, um, uh, it, it's just really made art accessible in different ways to people who otherwise might have had difficulty leaving the home. Um, you know, I have problems sitting through long performances because I have back, I have scoliosis, back problems. Um, so I've really enjoyed this, um, you know, ha having the ability to, to view more things at home, but it's important to make sure that it's accessible. Um, so we, as I mentioned, uh, virtual, we've had a virtual exhibition and performances, all these video conferences and webinars, I've been able to speak to people around the country in ways that I haven't before, as, and then online learning events and conferences. And this afternoon, um, I'm, I'm attending a, a creative aging event um, uh, hosted by the National Assembly of State Arts Agency. And, you know, otherwise I would have to worry about whether I could travel to get to these events. So it's been really opening for a lot of people, but we need to make sure that they're accessible. So work with, work, you know, look at the platform that you're using. If it's Zoom, if it's Teams, they have information on how to make it accessible. Um, make sure that you have effective communication for vision access providing audio and visual description. And I hope that I've been successful in providing the visual description and the, um, the, with the audio description in the um, uh, available here. Um, and I wanna give kudos to Mind's Eye for providing all of the access today. Um, so uh, uh, effective communication for hearing access can include CART, sign language interpretation as we have here. And then for people with intellectual, cognitive, developmental disabilities, making sure that you use plain language. Uh, reading everything on the screen is could be helpful to people with auditory issues um, or uh, other types of processing disorders, making sure that you don't use a lot of jargon. And I apologize if I've used some jargon here. Um, so make sure you use plain language. And um, so some, some tips for virtual events and calls. Um, so include in your registration that, that captioning will be provided. And then for other accessibility requests, please call quote th this number or this email by this date uh, to request an accommodation. Be sure to identify yourself when speaking if you're switching speakers around. Visually describe yourself and your slides and send the PowerPoint separately. Um, Zoom presentations are not screen reader friendly. So having the PowerPoint as um, a, uh, as PowerPoint or a PDF, make sure that that is saved um, in a, 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 that's created as a PDF that will ensure that, that it's accessible. There's a way to make PowerPoint uh, slides accessible and using the layout feature in your PowerPoint. I mean, I, I know I've been guilty of this. I, I often just 
create my own text boxes because I want to arrange them the way I want to arrange them. But I, I've learned that if you use the layouts in PowerPoint, it helps the screen reader read it more, more logically. And it's been really, it, it, it's been eye-opening for me to learn that. So um, we will make, you know, we'll make sure that what we send to you is accessible. So how do we pay for this? Um, you need to make sure that you build access into your budget from the start. Don't use, leave it as an afterthought because it can be very expensive to add it um, at the last minute or you may not have it in your budget. So put it in your budget, put it in your grant application. Price out the vendor options ahead of time and also ask your vendors what their deadline is for requesting it so that you know when to give the deadline to your audience. There are also cost effective and DIY options available. Um, we know that there's auto captions av available in many platforms and they are improving, but keep in mind that people in the deaf community do prefer live captions because the accuracy can be better. Um, like I said, put it as a line as a line item in your grant applications. I can't tell you how many times we look at our grant applications and we I Sometimes we see it and sometimes we don't. You need to make sure that you include it so that it can be budgeted for. And prioritize seeking donors and funders that are interested in accessibility. Um, and then, you know, look at your community partners and collaborators, arts and disability organizations, VSA affiliates. A lot of them have changed their names, but many are still around. Schools for the Deaf, Schools for the Blind can be very uh, um, helpful. Um, and provide lots of resources as well as audiences. Make sure that you partner with them so that they can, um, you know, their faculty and their, that their students might be interested in your events. Um, centers for independent living can be incredibly helpful. Um, look for disability organizations in your communities, including local chapters of national organizations. Your state libraries will have a, a, a library for, um, uh, we have this acronym in here that's uh, libraries for the blind and physically handicapped. And that's an old terminology that I think is being changed, but some states still have that. But look for those, uh, those library, uh, the, those parts of your state libraries. Um, and then businesses that serve people with disabilities. So these are great partners, collaborators. You can find, um, you know, I, I, we recommend forming a disability advisory committee to help you with this. And you can often find these individuals throughout all of these resources. So we, we said to take the start small and take the step, the first step. So determine who's in your community and what are their needs and interests. Communication is key. Be approachable to receiving accommodation requests and growing your audience base. Provide your website, phone number, email for access services, make it easily available. And then um, you know, be sure to include for access the, a statement about for access services, please contact with your phone and email. And start budgeting for access requests. So these are just some of the basics. And then once you've taken the first step, take the second step. So I have, um, before we end, I just have a number of training resources um, and we'll provide these, these URLs uh, from the, um, when we send the PowerPoint, the ADA National Network, and in your area, it's the Great Plains ADA Center. The US Access Board has a lot of resources. You can find the ADA 2010 design standards um, at ada.gov. The Smithsonian has guidelines for accessible exhibit design. The Mid-America Arts Alliance has an accessibility checklist. And the National Park Service has a, a publication of making historic prop properties accessible. Your state and local arts agencies are a great resource. Um, uh, uh, the Missouri Arts Council, the Illinois uh, State Arts Council are great resources. Um, as I said, the Mid-America Arts Alliance is our, our regional disability arts organizations. Um, I, I, these aren't in your area, but ArtSpark Texas, Art Mix is in Indiana, Arts for All Florida, those are the former VSA affiliates. Local art accessibility networks such as ACAC, um, there's also one in Chicago, um, the National Arts and Disability Center at UCLA, and uh, we also have a lot of funded projects that we can provide to you if you're interested in um, other NEA funded organizations that uh, if you want to see some examples. And I, I already mentioned all the all the digital things. I think I, I some duplication, but 
uh, web aim resources, but also the disability access symbols. So be sure to, to check those out. Oh, and I forget how many references resources I put in here. Um, and we'll, we'll send out, these are the links to those two videos, the one I showed you and the one I mentioned. Um, there's also one that um, Indiana did a disability awareness month video. So you can check that out. And the access board has animations on making um, uh, uh, physical facilities accessible. And that's it. Uh, you can reach me at 202-682-5567 or bienvenueb at arts.gov. And we'll make sure you have that spelling when we send out the, uh, the, the web, um, the PowerPoint afterwards. So I'll leave this up for just a second and then I'll, I'll, close, it, I'll, I'll close it out. And uh, we can do any, if you have any questions. Uh, I don't see any in the Q&A box, but do we wanna go back to Megan? Absolutely. This is Megan. Thank you, Beth. That was spectacular, as I knew it would be. I'll turn my camera on for a minute while I chat with you. Um, this is a reminder to throw some questions in the Q&A box. We do have a comment from Anne that I think is really important that I want to bring up. She says, however, as amazing as virtual options are for accessibility for visual impairments, virtual has limitations around additional sensory experiences. Um, and I definitely want to back that up. You, Beth talked about um, touch tours, um, and we're working on some haptic tours, hopefully after post-pandemic times, um, but lots of things like that, and lots of things that we just didn't realize were going to be an issue, like, like the chat box. I cannot tell you how many um, webinars or mostly meetings I've been to where you just hear the screen readers reading out all the chat over and over and over um, and it's I'm not using a screen reader and it's super annoying to me so I imagine people who are using a screen reader it's terribly annoying when all they're hearing is hi from Texas hi from Chicago instead of hearing uh, the person who's speaking so I we totally get that in um, and we're doing the best we can and hopefully we're we're getting better at it a year later um, but I wanted to toss that out there. Also, while we're waiting for questions, I wanted to throw out one of my favorite resources, um, not safe for work, but there is an episode of Drunk History that is amazing about the 504 sit-ins with Judy Human. Um, I will add that in the link, but again, it has a lot of language in it. So it is a drunk history, but it is uh, spectacular. And I've, I always wanna show that as a training video because it's a great history, but I can't you know, do that. Um, and one interesting note is Judy Human was played by Ali Stroker, the actress that won the Tony. Uh, for her production, her role in o the production of Oklahoma, and she is going to play Judy Human in a documentary or in a in a biopic about her. About, I just about read her. that. It's going to so be that's, great. That's amazing. We do have a question here from Joan. Um, Joan says it was spectacular in a time when funding has been cut so drastically for many of us. What are your suggestions for raising money for some of these costs, especially for small organizations? Um. I always tell people to look to their local arts agency. Um, it could be the city or the county agency, state arts agency. Some of them have have small funds. Um, I think um, Alliance uh, Mid America Arts Alliance has a has an accessibility fund. Um, and then um, uh, you know, like I said, you can build it into an NEA grant as a as a budget item. Um, and then just you know, include it as part of your capital campaigns. If it's part of if you if you need to uh, renovate facilities. Um, you know, look for local local donors. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't come up with, you know, some some magic bullet for this, but, you know, um, just recommending um, exploring that. Um, there isn't a lot of federal funding, um, but there might also be some other state agencies that, that have, have some, some funding opportunities for that. Um, and just look for local donors uh, and, and, you know, have some targeted um, funding campaigns for that. I will also reiterate what you said um, at some point. You said it probably a couple times. Put, make those line items in your budget. Things don't add accessibility at the end, not just because there's not time, there's not money. Um, so if your whole production is going to be funded and you don't put accessibility in at the beginning, 
you're probably not going to get it. And another thing I will throw out to all the funders who are represented tonight, um, today, whew, this morning, um, for the people out there who are funders, even though it's a requirement that you have to be accessible to get funding, um, it's really helpful if the budget in the grant, if there's a line item in the budget that's specifically for accessibility, because what are you going to leave it blank? You know, in your grant, just say, oh, we're not, we're not doing any accessibility. Um, so having that line item that an organization has to fill out for the grant, um, I think is also really helpful. Um, Joan has a follow up. Uh, what are your thoughts about applying for the NEA for grants? We have done it in the past and mostly been successful, but it is a bit daunting uh, it's for, for small organizations. Yeah, I, I, I totally get that. We, you know, that's the feedback that we get a lot. And some of the, um, the, uh, the, the, the work involved in applying is, is beyond our control. It's federal requirements. I would recommend to any organization, if you're thinking of applying for any federal funding, to go ahead and register with SAM.gov, that's SAM.gov, and grants.gov. You need to have those, you have to have a DUNS number, you have to have SAM and, and grants.gov registrations. Just do that now. Um, and and um, we provide a lot of useful information on our website. I recommend uh, checking out the link for our American Rescue Plan grants um, that, that I, we had earlier. Um, uh, just go to arts.gov and you'll see our, our American Rescue Plan uh, information right up front. Um, we have links in there uh, under resources for um, how to how to register for SAM.gov, grants.gov. We have video tutorials that are captioned. We have um, we have a number of tutorials out on our website right now that we we're we're engaged in a, a really heavy technical assistance effort for a. Um, uh, uh, for, for the American Rescue Plan. And if you check out some of those resources, that might help with when you go to apply for our regular grants. We're going to continue that uh, because we see that as, as a vital need um, to overcome these barriers to these applications. Um, every time we, we look at our grants, at a, our, our grant application process, we look at it to um, reduce the burden on, on the application, um, to make it shorter, to make it easier. And I think we've done as much as we can because we still have to get the information. But, um, you know, but the biggest recommendations are start early. Our grants for 2022 will be announced. The guidelines will come out in December. Um, check those out early. Um, don't wait till the last minute because um, our highest volume in our electronic system is the night that it's due. Um, so, so start that early. Um, and the other thing I can recommend is call the phone numbers, um, call our grant specialists. We usually get back within 24 hours. They are a, a, a wealth of information. They can help talk you through things, whether or not your, your application idea, um, your project would be eligible. Um, they're incredibly helpful. Um, we, because of the huge number of applications that we anticipate, um, we have li more limited capacity for this American Rescue Plan fund, but um, we do have some um, contact information and you will be able to talk with a live person. That there is a live Q&A session today, like I said, at 11 Eastern that will have ASL interpretation and captions, but there are also, we will also have a few others and other, other Q&A sessions before the deadlines and also throughout August. So check that out on our website. Um, and um, if I get a chance, I'll try to plop that in the chat, but it will be available as well. And, and when we send out the PowerPoint after. I'm actually gonna do that right now. This, I'm gonna, this is for the Q&A session. This is where you can register. Um, and uh, I will also post, if you click on grants to organizations, you will see all of our tech, all of our applicant resources. Um, so like I said- I will uh, take those links and plop them in our Facebook group as well. Yeah, oh, so I apologize if, if um, you know what? I realized I just sent those to just the host and panelists. I apologize to everyone. Um, I, 
doing 10 things at once. So are you, are you going to post them or they're yeah, going to be? I'll, I'll post them in our uh, Facebook group. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. No, I so, don't. I mean, right now we're, we're doing a lot for the American Rescue Plan grants, but um, we'll be doing, we'll be implementing more as we move into our regular grant cycle. Great. We also have a comment from Elizabeth who says, can't wait to learn more about adding website accessibility to my website design process. More to learn. So excited to learn. Yes. And website accessibility is, I think, super daunting. Um, I will also, again, reiterate what Beth said earlier about just having something simple that's easy to find on the first page about accessibility. Um, so many people say, well, I went to the website and couldn't even find if there was audio description. So I assumed there wasn't because I couldn't even find an accessibility page. If you can't find an accessibility page and it doesn't say it in the ticket sales, you might have audio description or ASL, but no one's going to know. Um, so just website accessibility is so important. Let's see, we're at 952. Does anybody have any last minute questions? I have a couple announcements I want to go through. Um, unless anybody else has anything else to throw in. I'm going to share my screen while we do that. I'm going to move all these boxes out of the way. Okay, so I have a couple exciting announcements before we wrap up. Um, first, I'm going to be hosting, this is Megan, me, I will be hosting a virtual audio description training in September, specifically for people who would like to become Minds Eye volunteer describers. And of course, you can take those skills back to your own organization as well. Um, but if you commit to becoming a Minds Eye volunteer, the training will be free. And we provide audio description for all types of things like live theater, but also sporting events where we've got uh, three Cardinals games coming, coming up. We do blues games, um, wrestling, <laughs> also meetings, webinars, all sorts of different things. And we are looking for all types of people. We are particularly trying to diversify our AD team. So we represent more cultural and ideological backgrounds, including but not limited to people who are Black, Hispanic or Latinx, Native American, Asian American, Jewish, members of the LGBTQ community, and fluent speakers of Spanish or Bosnian. Um, please, we really, we really need you. Um, and for those of you who are not from St. Louis, because we, I know we have some, some out-of-towners, um, Yes, I said Spanish or Bosnian. Those are the two languages we're really looking for. Um, do some research, you'll find out why. Uh, we'd also like to announce that Mind's Eye is currently looking for paid content and quality control consultants who are blind or visually impaired. We just started the search. Um, we just put the, app, the application up on the website. Um, it only took one person who was uh, visually impaired to tell us that the app wasn't as accessible as we hoped it would be. So this is why we need a, uh, a pool of content and quality control consultants. Um, so let me know, email me, and that is mharms at mindseyeradio.org. Um, every email you've gotten in the last two weeks pretty much have been from me. And also another announcement, um, we are exploring ideas for an ACAC fundraiser. We were planning an in-person trivia night in December, but now we're pretty iffy about doing anything in person anytime soon. If you have any ideas or suggestions, you guessed it, email me. Um, also, there are a couple questions about this on the survey that I'm going to send out later this week. Um, and. I want to thank everyone. First, I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank Lighthouse for the Blind St. Louis, the Arts and Education Council, and the United Way. I also, of course, want to send a big thank you out to Beth Benvenu, Jenny Sanders, our ASL interpreter from LAMP Interpreters, David, our CART interpreter from Here Inc., LaDonna, and our audio describer from Minds Eye was supposed to be Sarah. It was actually Angela. We had a last minute uh, substitution there. So we were glad, Angela. Thanks for joining us. Um, and Beth, do you have any last minute, last minute words or any last questions that anyone wants to throw in? 
Um, I just put in the chat, and I apologize if the uh, if that interfered with people's um, screen readers. That um, that that Q and A session starts in four minutes. Um, uh, yeah, I was I, I shifted the time the, the time around. I was thinking it was going to be later. Um, uh, and I, I put the link there. And all you have to do is type in your name and your email, and you can just uh, click register, and it takes you right to it, I believe. Um, but that's only if you have questions about. Um, the, the grant opportunity, but um, feel feel free to join that or or register for a later one. But note the accessibility features in that, wh whether or not it has captioning. Great, right. and you know what? That reminds me one one very last thing for those of you who have been to several ACACs in the last year. Um, we did change our registration um, stuff this time to go directly through Zoom to register. Um, the main reason we hadn't been doing that before is because they don't ask about accessibility. Um, so that's why the registration was a little bit weird. So if anybody has any comments about that, please email me um, because all those comments about your pronouns and if you wanted audio description or ASL, all of those things we had to add in to Zoom. So if anybody has any thoughts on that, please let me know. Otherwise, we're going to let Beth get out of here. She's got, she's got to go and I'm going to drop um, all this information into our uh, Facebook group and then I will email you everything also everyone. So thanks everyone for coming and uh, we really appreciate it and thanks to Beth and uh, thanks to Jenny. There's Jenny. <laughs> Bye Jenny. Um, so everybody have a good day. Thanks. Bye. Bye.